Trotter with us now from the Louisiana Nature and Science Center Planetarium. Yes. Um, normally, when we talk to folks from the Louisiana Nature and Science Center, we talk about animals on the earth and on the ground. <laughs> We're going to talk about everything up in the skies now. Everything that happens about the in the sky. Uh, the planetarium uh, was originally at St. Mary's Dominican College. It was donated to the Nature Center and was reconstructed there and opened in May of 87. And I came down from Shreveport Planetarium to run it. And uh, to tell you the truth, there's so many things going on at the planetarium, it's hard for me to keep up with it. <laughs> but uh, the basic structure of the planetarium, of course, is an educational institution. Primarily, we offer shows for school groups. We also offer shows for the public, general public. Uh, in fact, right now we have a show called How to Watch a Flying Saucer, which oh, really? seems like be fairly <laughs> obvious. You look at them, but as yeah. far as how to watch a flying saucer, it concerns uh, what details to look for. If you think you see something in the sky, you do not know what it is, this show will tell you how to uh, find out whether it's just a natural object, say the planet Venus or Jupiter or a weather balloon. You can, Those, you can dispel a lot of UFO theories if you can recognize them. a lot of them. Not every one of them. There are a few cases that are beyond explanation, at least at have, present have, time. Have you seen one? Not yet. Well, I've, se I've seen what at least was first a UFO in my mind, and then I found out it was a flock of birds, which is a, <laughs> which is a fair, fairly common occurrence. Yeah. So birds at high altitude, the city lights on them seem to glow almost. With, with or without UFOs, a, a lot of folks probably have not experienced the planetarium, and it is a great experience, a great way to look at the universe around you. They are. That's why, especially in the kind of weather we're having nowadays, it's so cold outside, no one wants to get outside and see the real nighttime sky, so <laughs> we have the sky inside the planetarium all nice and warm. Uh, we have laser rock concerts on Friday and Saturday nights, so we also have the entertainment area of it. So we cover really a broad range of uh, subjects in the planetarium. In fact, in, in March we have a show starting called Astrology Fact or Fiction. Thank you, Mark. Okay. And uh, get out there in March and you can see that planetarium out in New Orleans East at the Louisiana Nature and Science Center, 19 before the hour. Yeah. I didn't think anything could make this house look new again, but Sears side is like... ...with us today. Mark, what can we expect to see tonight? Well, tonight, uh, one problem we have is the moon's in the sky, which normally would be nice except for meteors that are fairly faint uh, the moon's light will wash them out so unfortunately the best time to see this meteor shower is not going to be 10 11 o'clock it's going to be somewhere between 2 and 5 saturday morning uh, so to get a good view of this meteor shower you're just going to have to stay up later and get up very early okay where's the best place to view the shower get as far away from city lights as possible uh, if you're in the middle of downtown, you'll have almost no chance to see these meteors. If you go to uh, north of the lake, uh, Hammond, uh, Hammond area, you should have a good view of it. Uh, as, far, as long as you're away from any really bright lights, and if it's clear enough, little haze, you should have a good view. And any particular direction in the sky to look? Most of the meteors will be coming from the northeastern sky. However, the best way to view them is just to lay down on a chase lounge or whatever you have outside and look up and look around. You're going to have to be patient. You might have to look for an hour before you really see a lot of meteors. Perhaps even a sleeping bag flat <laughs> on your back. Be that ready be for any one. occasion. Will any of this comet debris actually hit the Earth? Any of these meteors come down? A few may. And it's very, very rare for them to do that. Most of them burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. So we'll just see them as a very small and uh, very short-term streak of light. Uh, but uh, every once in a while we'll get hit by one. What are they actually composed of that we're looking at? Are they metal, rock, or pieces of ice from a comet tail? Combination of metal and rock. Uh, it depends on the particular comet it came from. Okay. It's on. You're looking at live pictures of the satellite and uh, slowly induce uh, a dampening rate on the satellite until they get the rotation completely stopped. Once the satellite is stopped, once they... two of the astronauts will hold it steady while Pierre Thuet tries once again to attach the capture bar. The capture bar will then pull the satellite to the shuttle's cargo bay. The satellite will be positioned on a new booster engine. And later tonight, the $157 million Intelstat satellite will be fired into its proper orbit. The prestige of NASA is on the line in this $93 million satellite rescue mission and the future of the shuttle program could ride on how well three astronauts can wrestle a satellite. In Washington, I'm Jack Clorty. 
And now to fill us in with a little background on the shuttle mission, Mark Trotter, the planetarium curator at the Nature and Science Center, joins us. Good evening, Mr. Trotter. Thank you for joining us. Um, I guess two things. One, the uh, spacecraft has had some problem maneuvering into position to grab hold of the satellite. And of course, we all know the problems that the astronauts have experienced trying to hook up with this, uh, this tow bar to the satellite. Why? Well, basically, they had a little navigation problem determining the exact position of the shuttle. And they have to know exactly where the shuttle is and where the satellite is so they can maneuver correctly. It might seem like a small matter, but uh, any collision between the shuttle and the satellite could uh, not only damage the satellite, but damage the shuttle tiles, which protect the shuttle during reentry. Uh, they've also just had problems with that this satellite was not designed to be retrieved by the space shuttle. Uh, that is what the capture bar is all about, attaching it to their to the satellite and then the space shuttle's remote manipulator arm can attach to it and pull it back in. Uh, satellites like the uh, Hubble Space Telescope are already designed for this and this is just something they didn't design into this satellite. Mm -hmm. We've heard so much about this three-person spacewalk. Why is this so significant? Well, uh, originally the shuttle was designed only for two astronauts to perform an EVA at a time. Uh, they simply need literally the human power out in space to grab a hold of this satellite. Uh, the uh, spacesuit is rather bulky, and uh, so they, they've been inside the uh, airlock for a good while now, and once uh, they are out, outside, it should not be a problem. However, if there is an emergency, they all three need to come back into the shuttle at the same time. That is not an easy thing. In fact, the Soviet Union, the very first human spacewalk, almost ended where the astronaut could, get, could not get back into his capsule after the spacewalk because of the low pressure in space, the uh, space suit inflates to a degree and actually becomes a little bit larger. Uh, it's uh, a little bit trying to like repack your suitcase after, on, after you're on a vacation. You can't <laughs> get it all back together and uh, in space that's a serious problem. Yeah. Aside from the, uh, the danger of these, uh, these three people trying to be out there at the same time, we're talking about the monumental cost. What is, what is at stake for NASA if this, uh, if this project doesn't work? Well, it's, it is a problem. Uh, this is the sort of thing that NASA is trying to put forth, that there is a need for man in space to do work like forth. this. Uh, a, a robot obviously could not do this by itself. Uh, I'm confident they will accomplish this. Uh, this is the sort of thing we need to do to be able to go in the future of space, to build space stations, to eventually explore the, the planet Mars and the other planets in our solar system. All right, well, let's hope they're successful this time out. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. That's Mark Trotter from the Louisiana Nature and Science Center. Well, in other news, late this afternoon, the Los Angeles... You know, the last time we saw a lunar eclipse was seven years ago, but we have another chance tonight. Starting at around 8.20, if you look to the southeast, you'll see it, and that's the topic of our cover story this afternoon. Beverly Carr joins us now live from the Louisiana Nature and Science Center. Bev? Terry, you know how they say that a full moon makes people do strange things? Well, some people think that a full lunar eclipse might intensify that, so any moon gazing you do tonight, you might want to take along someone you know and trust. I'm just kidding, of course. Seriously, it should be a good show that'll last about two and a half hours, and it's free. How many times have you gazed at the moon and thought it magical? Tonight, Mother Nature will become Merlin herself and make the moon disappear. There are a lot of technical terms associated with an eclipse, but it's really very easy to explain. Moon moving into the Earth's shadow. A very simple sort of thing. And it's fairly rare. Usually the moon misses the Earth's shadow. And when it does hit the Earth's shadow, it might just skim one edge of it. But this time it's going right smack to the center of the Earth's shadow. So it's going to be almost completely dark. Just how dark? How dark, we're not exactly sure. Depends on the uh, conditions of the Earth's atmosphere at the time, how much light can pass through the atmosphere and reach the moon. So we might see a dull, dark gray color moon. We might see a bright orange or a reddish color moon. We're just going to have to see what happens. We have a very good chance of viewing tonight's eclipse for two reasons. Not only do we live in the right spot, we live in the right time zone, so it's going to be at a normal hour instead of being at three or four in the morning. It's at a nice, reasonable time when everybody's, you know, after they've had supper, they can go outside and take a look at the eclipse. They don't have to keep their kids up real late. Now, because a lunar eclipse is a relatively rare occurrence, you may want to record it for future enjoyment. It is photographable. Experts suggest that you put your camera on a tripod or some other stable surface, that you use the fastest speed film you can get, 1,000 is the best, 400 will do, and experiment with the shutter speed. Still, you don't need any fancy equipment to watch this marvel of nature, just a little peace and quiet. You do not need a telescope. 
Uh, that's a nice thing. We, we can see the moon all the time, almost, almost every night, uh, in the same way tonight. Uh, it'll be visible. It'll be darker, of course, during the eclipse, but it should be visible unless you're right in the middle of city lights. Now, if you want to go high-tech and use a telescope, you've got two opportunities. Here at the Nature and Science Center, they will have several telescopes and binoculars set up. And also, the UNO uh, Department of Physics is also holding an eclipse watch tonight that is preceded by an information program. That all starts at 8.15 in the Science Building. Terry? All right, thank you very much. We'll hear more from Beverly Carr on this subject tonight at 6 o'clock. Here's a question. Our news source, this is 6 News Tonight. If you're in the right place in the right time tonight, you could see a pretty interesting show in the sky, the annual Perseid meteor shower. It's caused by particles from the comet Swift Tuttle entering the Earth's atmosphere and burning up. Of course, city lights can make the meteors hard to see. But Mark Trotter of the Louisiana Nature and Science Center is stargazing for us out, out at Fort Pike tonight. Good evening, Mark. What have you seen so far? Well, Norman, we haven't seen a lot of meteors, but the ones we've seen are very high quality, leaving trails behind. Now, exactly why we're not seeing as many as we predicted, well, that's anybody's guess, really. It's just a matter we haven't been lucky enough yet. But we still have a good number of hours that we could hit a big clump of meteor dust and then have a spectacular show. So it's not exactly uh, celestial fireworks or anything, but it's a nice show. We're having a good time. Sort of a carnival atmosphere out there. Everybody's having fun, you know, laughing and just looking around, seeing who can see what. And when we see one, it's really everybody lets out a scream and, oh, look at that one. So uh, we're having a good time. All right, it's interesting that you said there's still a lot to go because we've been, been getting a lot of calls from people tonight who want to go outside to catch the show, and they want to know how much time there's left. Uh, probably till around 1 o'clock, and, and the limiting factor here is the moon rise. The moon uh, is not extremely bright, but it's bright enough to blot out a lot of the dimmer meteors. However, the brighter ones we still should be able to see. So uh, if, you're, if you can go out before 1 o'clock, you'll do good. Even after the moon rise, it might still be worth looking at because we might hit a big clump of dust and then even the moon's light wouldn't be able to wash that out. All right, Mark, thank you for joining us thank and you. cluing us in on what uh, most of us are able, not able to view tonight. Mark Trotter of the Louisiana Nature and Science Center, our eyes and ears out there stargazing tonight. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. I got your telescope last weekend to see Halley's Comet. You've missed your best chance until March. That's what Mark Trotter told me. Yeah. yeah Bowie. Well, Mark at the Spar Planetarium says if you didn't see the comet last weekend, too bad. He said he saw it in just about all its glory. And Mark yeah. is here now. Mark, what did you see last weekend that uh, you didn't see before? Oh, uh, <laughs> it was something very special. The tail was so obvious it actually looked like a comet. Uh, before, I've been telling everybody oh, it looks like a fuzzy star, and uh, but now... It looks like a real comet, very bright coma, head around the comet, and a faint tail, but still with our telescopes, we, we can see it very easily, even see it with our unaided eye. We had around 600 people that saw it last weekend. We, we were swamped with people last weekend. Uh, you still may be able to catch a glimpse of it before it goes around the sun. In fact, if we want to take a look at where it is in the sky tonight, it's still in the east, not too far from the planet Jupiter. Jupiter is the brightest point of light in the sky tonight. Just look to the upper right of Jupiter, very carefully, of course, and you may see Halley's Comet. The main problem is moonlight. We've got a half moon tonight, and uh, that really brightens up the sky so much, you probably will not be able to see the tail. If you look carefully, you may be able to see the head of the comet, though. Are you interested at all, Mark, in what the space shuttles may bring back as far as photographs of this thing? Well, uh, it, the possibility is a great possibility there. The problem is I did have some technical problems right. with an image yeah. intensifier that went on a camera that they sent up with the space shuttle, so uh, apparently they won't get all the data back that they originally thought, but uh, a lot of information we gathered from space. There's a lot of, of uh, radiation light that cannot penetrate the Earth's atmosphere that the space shuttle can pick up, so later missions will be able to pick up some photographs anyway. That's one good thing. And briefly, Mark, how are you going to keep people interested from now until March, until you can really see the comet good again? Well, we just keep reminding them what it's going to be like in March and April. That if they, even if they've seen it already, they're going to see a lot more coming up. And not to be too disappointed if they haven't caught a glimpse of it yet, it is still, a, admittedly, a very faint object now. But March and April in the early morning skies, that's when we really get our best show of the world.
best thing right. to see. All right. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Mark. Now, if you'd like a spotter's guide uh, that the station and planetarium have put together, just send us a self-addressed stamped envelope to Spotter's Guide, KTBS-TV, P.O. Box 44227, Shreveport. That's zip 71134. If you live in... I'm shopping for my kids. One of them, Grant, is getting that pair of binoculars he's wanted to see Hallie's with. Oh, you know, a lot of people have comet fever, especially yeah. since Hallie's only comes around every 76 years or so. Well, joining us again today is our regular Friday guest, Mark Trotter, the head of Spar Planetarium. Now, Mark, is interest still high on Hallie's? I definitely believe so, at least according to the calls I'm getting. I'm 24 hours, I'm living Halley's Comet, at least for the next few months, and uh, of course, this is once in a lifetime, so I'm going to make the best of it. Uh, still lots of interest in it, and of course, it's going to be getting greater as it gets brighter. Wonderful. What, what can, uh, you're the head of SPAR, what can people get at SPAR, the planetarium, that they can't get by looking through their own binoculars or telescopes? Well, the first thing we offer, of course, is our planetarium show, Comet Halley Once in a Lifetime. Uh, that's an uh, educational experience. You can watch a TV show about Halley's Comet, but seeing it in the planetarium, on that dome is something totally different. And of course, also, we offer large telescopes that most people cannot afford on their own and offer them to the public almost every clear night. That's one thing. Now, Mark, you brought along a camera today, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Tell well, us about that. Just a regular old 35 millimeter camera. A lot of people ask me, how can I get a photograph of the comet? Unfortunately, they cannot go out with their disk camera and no. Instamatic and take a <laughs> photograph of it. Uh, they need a 35 millimeter camera with an ability of holding the shutter open because to take a photograph of anything in space, you need to have a time exposure uh, from 30 seconds to sometimes 30 minutes. And to do that, you need to attach a cable release onto the shutter button on the camera, set the camera to infinity, and use fairly high speed film, somewhere between 400 speed and 1,000 speed to film. It's really going to be up to the individual to experiment with different exposure times and different films. And the time to do that is now. So they can take photographs of the sky now, get a good idea of what their camera can do. And then in March and April, when Halley's at its brightest, they can get a good photograph to show to their grandchildren and say, I took this photograph. This is what I saw. Will you need a tripod for that, by the way? Definitely need a tripod, especially for something that long. There's no way to hold it yeah, with your own that hands. Would look no bad. way to do that. You need a very sturdy tripod to hold it on. and know a uh, little bit about the sky because the sky does move. Anything over about 30 seconds with an ordinary camera and an ordinary tripod, you're going to leave star trails. Anything longer than that, you need a camera attached to a telescope. That's a little bit more advanced than most people want to get right now, though. Okay, I've got to ask you where you look. Okay, right now, it's almost directly overhead about sunset. Okay. We get a, if we get clearing in the sky, we'll be able to see it later on tonight, maybe obviously tomorrow night if it clears up and almost directly overhead, south of the Great Square of Pegasus. There's a very faint patch of light in the sky. Still need a pair of binoculars or a telescope to see it well, but it is very faintly visible to the naked eye. Okay, okay. Mark, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. And if you want to know more about Halley's, we are offering a free and handy brochure on the comet. Here it is. Uh, it's sponsored by Channel 3 and Spar Planetarium. It has a lot of nice information. You can pick up a copy at the planetarium or simply send us a self-addressed stamped envelope to KTBS-TV. 312 East Kings Highway. That zip code is 71104. Is tonight going to be the night to see it? Uh, probably.